Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Steve Sand. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. Before I introduce the speaker and the subject of this evening's seminar or webinar, uh, let me just remind you that if you are new to this series of events, uh, we, we use the Q&A box for you to raise questions. It would be very helpful for you to provide some information about yourself that enables me to provide um, to assess the range of questions uh, in terms of backgrounds from the people who I'm picking the questions from. But if you would like to remain anonymous, please say so in your question box and I will not read out your name or your affiliation so that your privacy will be respected. But it is helpful for me to know who you are as I pick the questions. If you are watching this from the um, Facebook feed, you will still be able to raise questions and the questions will be transferred by Archies to me uh, in due course. For this webinar, I'm delighted to present to you a very distinguished scholar who not only is a leading expert on China, but that of multiple countries who are important in affecting the future of um, China and China's relations with important parts of the world. And that is, of course, Professor Gilbert Rossman of Princeton University. Professor Rossman is, at the moment, an emeritus professor at Princeton University. He's also the editor-in-chief at the ASAN Forum. Um, he is an extraordinary scholar for whom I have long-standing admiration, not, least, not only for his scholarship, but for the range of disciplinary expertise and countries' expertise that he holds. He is somebody who is fluent in not only Chinese, but also in Russian and Japanese, and is also uh, able to function in Korean, which are the kind of countries that we will be addressing a lot in this evening's discussions on the subject of comparison of a new Cold War with the old Cold War. Now, Professor Rosman has published so extensively, I think, any attempt to try to take even a sampling of his publications to illustrate his range of expertise would be somewhat misleading. So I'll only sort of highlight what I know as his, um, one of his more recent single authored uh, major publications. And that is of course thinking, strategic thinking about the Korean nuclear crisis, four countries caught between North Korea and the United States. With that, I'll hand over to you, Gil, for the next 40, 45 minutes. Steve, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I'm delighted to be joining you. I have uh, been thinking a lot about this turning point we're at uh, and what it signifies. Uh, and so this is a good opportunity to share some of my impressions of where things are heading. Um, I have three big questions right now. Uh, it's sort of the starting points for, for this thinking. The first is, what should we expect from the Biden administration based on the people he's appointing and their recent writings? I think they're giving us a kind of guideline for a, a grand strategic vision. And they work together. They've, many of them have served together in the Obama administration. Uh, 
Uh, a number of them have co-authored pieces. So I think we have an unusually clear impression of what a new administration is seeking to do in the Indo-Pacific region. So that's the first effort that I'm uh, exploring. The second question is, what is China's regional strategy and how far back does it go? I think people have paid too much attention to BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is focused primarily on the South and the West. Whereas I regard Northeast Asia as the most important part of China's strategic approach. And I think we need to emphasize what Xi Jinping has in mind as a kind of Sino-centric orientation uh, to the surrounding environment. And the third question that I raise before I focus more clearly on the Cold War issue is what kind of regional architecture is being contemplated for the Indo-Pacific. So we start with Japan in the late 80s, early 90s, seeking a kind of <clears throat> uh, Asian regionalism, which Japan could lead jointly with the US. And then we get South Korea at various times trying to present a kind of Northeast Asia centric approach where the Korean Peninsula became, becomes the driving force. And of course, we get the Chinese strategy and various US approaches. But so what is the regional architecture? Did the six party talks guide us into that? Uh, is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or Russia and China trying to dock the Eurasian Economic Union and the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, a, a sign of where we're heading? So this is uh, my question about architecture and particularly with regard to how the Biden administration is reinterpreting the Indo-Pacific uh, initiative, the free and open Indo-Pacific of, uh, of Trump. We don't expect the same term to be used as a sense of regional architecture. So I start with those, those questions. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety <laughs> in the countries of East Asia of what, uh, what's gonna happen, both because of Biden's uh, leadership, which they're not certain about, uh, and because of what the Sino-US relationship will bring, as well as what recent changes in Chinese policy uh, may be. Uh, so I think that we see um, uh, some fearing US abandonment uh, thinking that uh, Obama's so-called strategic patience towards North Korea, which I think was a misnomer, uh, was, is a sign of further uh, weakness or abandonment. And some are afraid of uh, being entrapped, the entrapment that it could occur if the U.S. has a, a very pronounced strategy that obliges South Korea to do things it doesn't want and Japan to do things it doesn't want and so on. Uh, so the question of whether we're entering a Cold War uh, relates very clearly to the anxieties being expressed in many of the countries of the region. So let me turn to the issue of the comparison. First, I'm generally on the side of thinking we are entering a Cold War. I know that uh, one of the architects of the uh, Biden administration, now the uh, advisor to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Eli Ratner, has argued it's quite different from the old Cold War. He doesn't really seem to want to use the Cold War expression. I think there's a tendency not to jump the gun and call it a Cold War, uh, but that based on the conditions uh, and based on the likely Chinese responses to US policy, I'm afraid that that's the term that I would, that I would find most relevant. Um, a Cold War, in my mind, has four primary dimensions. 
The first is a geographical tug of war, where there are areas that are uh, up for grabs. So in the first Cold War, it was primarily Europe. And the Berlin airlift was a sign of, of that struggle from uh, the late 40s. Um, I think in this Cold War, it's going to be East Asia, Indo-Pacific region broadly. And so uh, the South China Sea, Taiwan, the Korean Peninsula are three of the likely battlegrounds uh, over what uh, spheres of influence, which the US doesn't accept, um, types of international or regional order, um, which the US does regard as, as the way of phrasing it. So this is the geographical element. Um, and I think that we, we're going to see uh, tests of this. And I, in a moment, will talk about the Korean Peninsula as, I believe, the greatest test over the last 20 some years of what kind of Cold War we may be facing. The second um, dimension is uh, uh, strategic, an arms race, a, uh, a battle over space technology and uh, cyber technology. Um, I think this is becoming more and more uh, a reality that we're facing. So not only do we have clearly demarked geographical areas where China and the US are more and more competing and more likely to face the potential of conflict. We also have the, um, the space, the, the arms race heating up very substantially with Russia having done quite a bit to further China's competitive uh, level versus the United States and its allies. So the third dimension is economics. Of course, that involves what's already being called technological decoupling with 5G in the forefront. The idea that the US uh, is fearful of China's uh, efforts to uh, use intellectual property rights uh, violations and <clears throat> espionage uh, to uh, steal and find ways to get more of the US technology and also to implant types of technology which give them um, access to, um, to secrets uh, in, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and Russia is deeply involved in that technological competition as well, although not with having to fall to rely on China for 5G. Um, so how does this, before I go to the fourth dimension, uh, let's ask how does, how do the technological and economic and security dimensions differ from the previous Cold War? Well, in the previous Cold War, we did come up with some treaties, some rules for how the Soviet Union and the United States would compete. But of course, it was an arms race that intensified. And one of the ways the Cold War ended up being resolved was when the US was clearly winning that arms race in the 1980s. Um, this arms race looks like it's going to be a long term process, as was the first one. And uh, with a lot of new elements to it. Uh, the, the economic dimension has changed fundamentally, of course, with China gaining um, recognition as a number two economic power in the world and having created a situation where many countries are economically dependent on it. The Soviet Union did not do that, except for the countries that were called satellites, uh, which were 
restricted in their access to the international markets. China has managed to find a different approach to um, establish close trade ties with many US allies and partners and make it more difficult for them to join in a, uh, a broad decoupling process. Uh, so the economics are, are much more complicated this time. Does that mean we don't face a Cold War? I don't think so. Uh, finally, uh, I want to talk about national identity. As I worked on my, um, my teaching over the years, I increasingly became focused on trying to bridge disciplines, sociology, history, political science, by developing a, an analytical approach to national identities and to look at internal factors that shape foreign policy um, so that Russian national identity, Chinese national identity, Japanese, Korean identity uh, became big, a big part of my investigation. And I broke the subject of national identity down into uh, multiple dimensions rather than treating it as, a, as a, a loose term the way much of the literature is done. And the first dimension that I focused on was ideology. And so I think one of the reasons why I see a, a new Cold War emerging is I think we have a real ideological struggle going on. China, I believe, has, despite the fact that it doesn't insist on quoting Marx and Lenin and Mao the way it once did, um, there is still quite a bit of quotation and there is an insistence on it, the socialist element of its ideology. And in terms of its domestic policy, it's become much more ideological in its orientation. So um, I think it's driven the ideological uh, polarization that is occurring. Also, its policies on human rights, uh, anti-democracy, um, uh, its policies to uh, on ethnic minorities uh, on Hong Kong have raised a sense of ideological struggle in the West. Suddenly, people are becoming aware of the difference over ideology. If I had to break ideology down as I've done into three parts for China, I would say the first part is socialism. The second part is um, Confucianism, Sinocentrism, but it's not traditional Confucianism. It's how China has reinterpreted uh, elements of Chinese tradition and made them so salient that they've become an ideological uh, force, un un unquestioned in uh, Chinese mainstream writing. And the third, I would say, is anti-imperialism, sometimes called anti-hegemonism, uh, anti-West. And I think that has been a huge part of Chinese ideology since the 1990s. It really never went away. Um, and it, uh, whether, it was calling what the U.S. did ideological and assisting China is pragmatic. And the U.S. is the only country driven by Cold War mentality and uh, an old ideology. They was, nonetheless, they were making it into an ideological struggle, often distorting the thinking from the, the U.S. So I regard the presence and the strengthening of the ideological dimension on the Chinese side and the awakening to an ideological dimension on the US side as an indicative of a Cold War element. The second element of national identity that I would raise is history, the temporal dimension, how different periods of history are contrasted between two countries a national identity gap emerges in this uh, setting. And I would regard China's 
interpretation of all periods of history, not just the history of one century of humiliation, uh, but the earlier history contrasting uh, the negative interpretation of Western history, internecine wars and so on, with the positive, glowing, distorted interpretation of Chinese history, so different from the Maoist era with its very negative interpretation of parts of Chinese history, such as Confucianism, and the treatment of the Korean War, which Xi Jinping, even before he took the top position, uh, spoke about in very ideological terms, um, North Korea being a socialist country and the significance of this war and in the history of, of, of China, very, very important element. And then the, um, <clears throat> the treatment of really the, the Cold War era has changed and the post-Cold War era. So really whatever period of history you look at, it's the challenge of how do we interpret it has become much greater. And this is similar to the Soviet US difference of interpretation of much of history. And of course, uh, it, it started as uh, a Marxist effort to divide history into periods and to uh, establish a kind of rigid orthodoxy about how each period should be interpreted. The third dimension I cover um, that suggests this kind of sh sharp polarization is um, sort of sectoral elements of identity, political identity, economic identity. Do you have a superior economic system? Is the other side's system uh, faulty and failing? Uh, and third, the civilizational identity. Uh, a big push to argue that China is a, is a, a superior civilization historically uh, and the West is civilizationally flawed. However, they, they interpret that. Uh, of course, it extends beyond the West, Japan, uh, and Korea, South Korea, for being too influenced by Western civilization when they should have stuck with being part of the Confucian traditional Eastern civilization. So this is the third, and China has become more insistent since the global financial crisis on its superior economic system, and of course, especially in the past year, on its superior political system for handling the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the fourth dimension is, uh, is state society relations, what I call the vertical dimension. And there too, there's a very sharp difference. The US is now increasingly calling China authoritarian. Of course, that's what the distinction was with the Soviet Union, authoritarian or totalitarian. And, um, and the faults China places on the US system, particularly the attacks on democracy that have been intensifying recently. There's also an international or horizontal dimension looking at the international community in, in very different ways, uh, the regional community in different ways. And finally, the, uh, the intensification of dimension, how identities have become much more intensified. Uh, and so therefore, I argue that uh, when you look at national identity, you get a particularly good sense of how we are uh, split. And in a, in a book that I published some years ago, based on research I did in Chinese sources in 2010, 2011, when I was sort of devoted to looking at these sources, I argued that the Chinese response in 2008, 2009, 2010, to some new developments portended the demonization of the United States and the ideological and identity split that is indicative of a Cold War, which has only been borne out recently. So I wanna focus on one example right now, the Korean Peninsula, because I see that as the test case of the relationship between China and the United States. 
Um, and just as there were various test cases in the first Cold War, I think this is showing us what's happening. So in the 1990s, China was pretty silent about its position on North Korea. The US finally came up with the agreed framework. Uh, the, but China was essentially saying, this is your problem. We, we're, we're not deeply involved, but China was enabling North Korea, just as it had done in the 1980s when, and 70s when Sino-US relations were improving. That did not change China's uh, approach to North Korea. And in the 1990s, although it was quieter, it continued to provide the energy and food vital to North Korea's uh, survival during its uh, famine years. So in the 2000s, we had a different Sino-US relationship over North Korea. Um, US really wanted China's cooperation. South Korea now had the sunshine policy to um, try to bring countries together, all of the relevant countries, to have a joint policy on North Korea and engage North Korea. Um, the US appealed to China to really get North Korea back to the talks. And we ended up with six party talks with China in the moderating position. But when you look at the, the interpretations of what they, were, they, they brought, uh, we only looking carefully could see very sharp differences. George Bush was tended to say, it's five versus one. Everyone wants the nuclearization in North Korea. China is on the same side as the United States. But when I did my research in 2003 to 2005 or six on the book that Steve just mentioned about the North Korean nuclear crisis, I argued that, North, that China and Russia were absolutely not with the US or Japan. Uh, South Korea was somewhat in the middle under a progressive government, um, uh, interpreting how to deal with North Korea. And when the US shifted and compromised towards North Korea, that did not win over the Chinese and Russians and their interpretation of what was needed. And then in the critical period, the end of 2008 and the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, North Korea abandoned the six party talks, tested a nuclear weapon, uh, and it, before long uh, took provocative actions against South Korea. And the response in China, as well as Russia, was it's South Korea's fault. It's not North Korea's fault. If the US and South Korea had a different negotiating position, and if the conservatives have not won in South Korea and changed the South Korean policy towards North Korea, we would continue having the six party talks. And their idea was to try to use those talks to create a regional security system in Northeast Asia that would weaken the US alliance system and help change the regional order. Um, actually, Russia was more aggressive in taking that position. China was a little quieter, but when you looked at what Chinese were really writing, um, it was there were elements of Sinocentrism and how they wanted this issue to be resolved. And whenever South Korea did not rely heavily on China, as in the case of 2018, when South Korea uh, started uh, direct diplomacy with North Korea, the Chinese weren't happy. Sure, South Korea was doing some things China wanted, but basically China was saying, you're not going through China, you're just bringing in the United States. That's not a solution to the problem. Um, and they would not be sympathetic. And they had five summits between uh, Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping. And we don't know the exact contents of those summits, but we have to assume uh, China was growing increasingly favor positive towards, uh, towards North Korea. And even though it hasn't 
openly broken with the intense sanctions it agreed to. And, and particularly in this last year, the pandemic curtailed contacts across the border almost completely because North Korea has tried to isolate itself. The, the impression is that China is ready to strengthen ties. It's already weakened the sanctions regime and it will make it difficult for the Biden administration to carry forward a maximum pressure campaign with the possibility of dialogue with North Korea uh, to rally countries behind a joint strategy to North Korea because China's ambitions on the Korean Peninsula have become ever more apparent and its pressure on South Korea has become more intense. Um, it's not just North Korea, but South Korea that's faced uh, retaliation, sharp sanctions over its agreement with the US to uh, deploy the THAAD missiles uh, for defense against North Korea. China says no, it's part of a cold war against China to attack China, uh, to weaken China's um, missile um, uh, capacity. And it is, a, uh, it is a sign that South Korea doesn't have a balanced foreign policy. And Moon Jae-in, when he came president, had to improve relations with all these sanctions operating and China so angry. And he gave China a veto on, North, on South Korean foreign policy with the three no's saying he would not do certain things, military things, uh, like a trilateral alliance with uh, Japan or uh, installing missiles, uh, more missiles. He was freezing what he was doing with the THAAD. So in other words, China now feels it has that kind of leverage over South Korea and is ready to pounce if South Korea, for instance, has a conservative president come in who uh, is, uh, again, trying to emphasize relations with the United States rather than what China calls is a balanced relationship between, in, between the United States and China and South Korean foreign policy. So it's this test over the Korean peninsula that we see happening. And North Korea is likely to uh, re return to provocations. Um, it's got to get the attention of the Biden administration. Um, we don't know exactly how long it will wait to get that, but it just sitting around is not in North Korea's interest. Their economy is in very great difficulty right now, both because of the sanctions and because of the pandemic. Um, and it is um, Kim Jong-un had to apologize to his people, extremely unusual in his January uh, New Year's speech uh, because the economy has done so poorly. Um, and uh, meanwhile, uh, there's every reason to think he's counting on China to, uh, to stand at least quietly behind him if he does undertake those provocations and asking the US to come back to the talks and accomplish what the Hanoi summit failed to accomplish, uh, which would be a new um, uh, agreement that essentially recognizes North Korea as a nuclear power and puts denuclearization as a vague long-term goal while uh, strengthening, reducing the sanctions and strengthening North Korea's position uh, in the region and the world. So that I see as a particularly keen issue. One could go into detail on Taiwan, on how the Chinese are more and more using economic coercion. The prime case in the last half year has been Australia, uh, going beyond what China did towards South Korea after the THAAD deployment, because it's angered over Australia uh, on ideological grounds, uh, including Australian uh, statement that uh, there should be an investigation of the origins of the pandemic, uh, that China was denying that opportunity. Um, so the, we got China forcefully uh, reducing uh, Im, um, imports from uh, Australia and taking other measures to counter Australia. So let me conclude having focused on this one case to, some, to, to a great degree and conclude by saying in all 
dimensions that I see as important to a Cold War, we have a widening divide between China and the United States. I believe China is the main driver of this Cold War, that the fact that the US uh, has awakened to what is happening is not the sign that the US should be seen as the driver. However, how the US responds is complicated because especially of the economic dimension and the fact that this is being fought in the Indo-Pacific region close to China where China has developed uh, ties uh, with so many countries. And the, I think the Trump administration handled it very badly. They made it ideological in ways it did not need to be. They made it seem as this is against the Chinese Communist Party and we've returned to the free world versus communism. A, a way of thinking about identities that doesn't win much sympathy in the East Asian region. Um, they, um, they focus so much on changing the status quo in Taiwan, although that, that's the tendency right now. And I think it's driven especially by China's uh, more aggressive approach to Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, that it seemed as if we weren't going to be able to coexist with China and find common ground the way we had been previously and the way we were usually able with the Soviet Union when there were certain rules that were established uh, that how you behave and when we thought the Soviets broke the rules in Afghanistan in 1979 that turned the Cold War into a much more heated um, uh, problem. Uh, so I would argue that <clears throat> uh, Biden needs to and will adopt a more nuanced approach. There will be not one big coalition on all issues versus China, but a series of um, coalitions uh, issue by issue, whether it's uh, 5G technology, whether it's dealing with Taiwan, whether it's human rights, uh, whether it's the Korean Peninsula, we will have different countries involved in different ways. Uh, it's gonna take a complicated foreign policy. And I think right now um, I'm hopeful that the people joining the, uh, the administration are knowledgeable, uh, experienced, and already thinking seriously about the complexities of how to manage this different relationship. I don't think it's in the US interest to start calling this a Cold War. That seemed to me to um, not serve the purposes of multilateralism and managing the crisis most effectively. Even if we think there is a Cold War, I think it's wise to say the US has a mixed strategy. It's eager to work with China on some issues. And after all, the US worked with the Soviet Union on some issues. Um, it's going to build first its alliances and partnerships and strengthen ties. Uh, having stressed Korea, I should add that I think India will be the number one country in this struggle over the Indo-Pacific demarcation, geographical demarcation. And already the Russians are saying, China is doing a lot of damage with its policy towards India. Russia wants a China-India-Russia relationship and they see China driving India to the United States, particularly with the Himalayan uh, battle uh, that took place uh, in the last year. So I think that uh, one has to talk a lot about uh, India in this context and perhaps the fact that the US vice president is have Indian, half of Indian descent will eventually become a, a factor in the US efforts to strengthen ties with India. Anyway, I'll stop there and look forward to your questions and comments. Well, thanks very much indeed.
um, Professor Rotsman, I think it is the usual to the fulls of a presentation that you have made. I think your uh, four criteria for defining a Cold War is cogent, but let me sort of, before I open this to the floor and invite questions, and let me kick off the webinar by playing the devil's advocate and say that yes, it is all very well thought through and uh, cogently put, but then there are also important differences between the old Cold War and what we're dealing with now, aren't there? I mean, one is, is in terms of the uh, scale of economic integration. Um, in the Cold War period, the world was in some ways bifurcated. There wasn't a globalization process. There was not the kind of economic integration that we see today that the nearly four years of the Trump administrations to advocate decoupling hasn't really got very far. The pandemics perhaps has done a bit more in terms of um, economic decoupling than the Trump administration policies ever managed to do. Reality remains that the two economies became, remain very closely integrated. The enormous amount of vested interests, particularly on the American side, to want to keep that integration uh, and the global supply chain we are also talking about a different kind of ideological contest that uh, compared to the old Cold War. So I take what you say about the, um, the ideological dimension of it, but the big difference here is that last time there was a very clear defined ideology on the, in fact, on both sides, in terms of communism versus democracy, capitalism. To this time, we are talking about more like a contest of which system is better, but not a um, life and death struggle. We are not seeing the kind of Khrushchev banging his shoes on the uh, table and say, we will bury you type of things. Now is my system, China's system is better than your system or the Americans coming back and say, well, actually our system is pretty robust for all the problems we have. So they're not quite the same thing, are they? Or perhaps they are. <laughs> well, you've raised two very clear and uh, uh, significant differences. And I do not disagree with either, but I would put them in a different context. I think what we have, and Biden has stressed, more manufacturing in the United States. The US has stressed, Made in China 2025 creates many problems. They're trying to take over the technologies that, uh, that, that the US and the US allies are strong in. Um, and we have to prevent the loss of these technological edges by much, by much stronger export controls and, and Chinese investments in foreign companies and telecommunications. So I think it's a, a bifurcated economic process. Yes, consumer goods and other things keep integration going, but the decoupling I think is only gathering steam. It's going much faster than it used to. Supply chains that aren't dependent on China so that even though things do come from China of great value for com consumers, there should not be a dependence on China. And also, what should the US do to protect its allies like Australia, like South Korea, when China retaliates, when China imposes sanctions? US needs a multilateral strategy, economic strategy to prevent these countries from being subject to Chinese uh, economic coercion. So I don't think the economic picture is uh, just primarily integration. In fact, I see what's happening as getting more and more decoupling in technologically significant areas. We will um, see where that goes. The second area in ideology, it's absolutely true that um, there is a 
a, a different element to the ideological struggle. That's why I put ideology as one factor in national identity. And even the ideological struggle with the Soviet Union was toned down for a while uh, in the 60s under P Khrushchev's peaceful coexistence. Um, and with the thought that uh, uh, there was US and the Soviet Union were negotiating various agreements. It was thought that we, we could coexist. We didn't have to emphasize their Marxist Leninist Stalinist nature. After all, they were in de-Stalinization. And we could find a way to, uh, to coexist. We called them authoritarian, much more than communist for a while. Um, so I do see that uh, um, there's, there's a, a difference. But I think both China's shift back towards ideology and the US attentiveness after Trump blurred the picture of human rights in China and made the ideological difference with China seem very cloudy. I, do th I think that Obama, Biden's uh, summit of the democracies that's being discussed and other efforts will bring these differences much to the fore. The fact that <clears throat> Xinjiang um, genocide or not genocide, Hong Kong a denial of the basic uh, rights that were promised, um, the uh, re assertiveness of Xi Jinping uh, about uh, Chinese uh, opposition to democratic values, all of that in my mind means we really do have a, a significant ideological difference. Okay, um, let me move the discussions <laughs> on to something that we have not addressed so much so far, which yeah. is the role of Russia. And uh, two questions here, one from Nikolai Sumit and then another one from Jonathan uh, Fonella, both dealing with the issue of Russia. What Nikolaj would like you to say is what is the role of Russia in this new version of the Cold War, which also parallels Jonathan's question about the Russian trajectory in this US Chinese context. And Jonathan in particular would also like you to comment on whether the Pod Navani protest fit into this or not. Is this a kind of issues that is going to come into play in because of the Russian politics and therefore in the wider geopolitics. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's been no issue that has more interested me than the Sino-Russian-US strategic triangle since in 1964 as a, an undergraduate, I wrote my first serious research paper on Sino-Soviet relations. I've been fascinated by this subject ever since and uh, spent time in the Soviet Union and China and then kept, keep coming back to this subject over and over. And in the last five years, there's been a lot of uh, think tank interest in Washington about what is the nature of the Sino-Russian relationship. Um, I follow it closely. And for instance, um, uh, today I finished uh, what I, for my journal, the Asan Forum, the country report Russia, where I read about 25 Russian articles on the Indo-Pacific, many of them on China, and try to analyze what is Russian thinking about China right now. Um, the last 30 years have seen a continuous buildup of Sino-Russian relations, beginning in 1992. Um, and each stage people have been saying, well, isn't Russia gonna be uncomfortable being so uh, dependent on China um, and later asymmetrically dependent on a country so much stronger than Russia in so many ways? And it has been a surprise to a lot of observers that Russia has been driven ever closer to China. And last October for the first time, Putin 
left open the question of whether Russia would seek an alliance with China. Before that, he wasn't acknowledging the quasi-alliance elements of this relationship. Um, so I think the main conclusion in Washington, including among several who are joining the Biden administration, is that the Russian-Chinese relationship is too strong to, for the US to try to look for a different trajectory where the US could improve relations with Russia. And in fact, if Russia had had that intention, it had such a wonderful opportunity under Trump because he was so adoring of Putin. Um, and he, if Russia hadn't, uh, hadn't kept doing things like the Navalny poisoning uh, and arrest, uh, they would have seen more chances that the US would say, hey, maybe Russia isn't so beholden to China. Maybe there is room. And of course, Japan tested this for five years. Abe uh, was wooing Putin and saying, oh no, I don't have the US policy. I really want a better relationship with Russia. And Putin turned, to, turned, turned him down. China, Japan got nothing out of it. Um, so I don't really think there's a lot of promise. And yet, in this recent batch of art, Russian articles, there was more nervousness about the future of Russia-China relations than I've seen at any time in at least the last decade. And that was particularly over the issue of India. The, the sense that if Russia sticks so close to China, it loses India. And that's the, they had no one else. They kept talking about multipolarity and Russia has all these other partners. And now it looks like uh, they, they just treat Japan and South Korea as satellites of the United States don't be, they don't, cannot be taken seriously except for some economic issues. But if they lose India, they have no one left in, in the Pacific. It's all China. And that's causing a lot of nervousness. And they also say China's aspirations in the Arctic Ocean are to deny Russia its total exclusive control and sovereignty. China wants freedom of navigation in that area. So that's another big issue uh, that Russians are worried about with regard to China. So there are tensions. Uh, some of them came out last year over the city of Vladivostok's anniversary, uh, which China took exception to as located in an area which had been uh, seized by the Ru uh, Imperial Russia 150 years ago. Uh, so um, I don't deny the tensions, and it's not a close alliance in the way U.S. alliances are with Japan and other countries. But still, given Putin's overall orientation and the Russian national identity, which I haven't said much about, I don't see any alternative to China in the foreseeable future. Okay. <clears throat> the next set of questions I'm picking comes from um, two people. One is from Duncan Ballard in London. And Duncan would like to raise for discussion with you that you, you talk about the Americans describing China as authoritarian. And of course, in the Western media, when the term is being used, it's being used in a negative and somewhat derogative way. Do you see the Chinese government seeing this as an insult or perhaps not? And in parallel, to also likes to bring in the question from um, David Gao. And the question is about how do you think the Chinese people, in contrast to the Chinese government, how do you see the Chinese people view the Chinese government's actions on Hong Kong, Taiwan, and in Xinjiang? In parallel, that's, are they happy with the authoritarianism or not? And repression. Um, well, I think we're getting more and more to the point where there's talk of the Beijing consensus and the Washington consensus, the China model and the Western model. And in those terms, China is more comfortable discussing the nature of its political system in a positive way. Um, the failure of the uh, 
US system in particular. So um, I don't think they, they, they're using the word authoritarian specifically. Uh, in the late 80s, there was talk of neo-authoritarianism as China's um, new approach. Um, but I, I don't think there's any doubt that they contrast what they have to democracy in the West uh, and speak very positively about Xi Jinping's uh, control over the country. That's at the national official level. Um, are there a lot of people in China who have been exposed to the West and greater information who are very uncomfortable with things that Xi Jinping has do done? Did we see some of that in February, of late January, February, when the Wuhan um, uh, lockdown occurred and people online were saying the fault was in the system? Uh, that's been crushed. The censorship has become much more intensive. Uh, so uh, it's hard to determine the degree to which there is uh, uh, popular opposition. I think the, the claims of success uh, in dealing with the pandemic uh, and economic signs that they were successful and the shortcomings that the US so vividly exposed uh, most recently in the insurrection at the Capitol give more people in China pause to think that they're not in such a bad system compared to the alternative. But nonetheless, because of a lot of problems in China over the environment, the lack of uh, uh, opportunity to speak out, the growing crackdowns by Xi Jinping in some areas, um, uh, my, my guess is there are a lot of people who are unhappy that Xi Jinping doesn't have that great popularity, although he's trying to develop national identity arguments in each dimension that will bolster his support. And we saw after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when some people said, oh, people are naturally democratic. And now that they've gotten rid of the communist uh, leadership, they will become much more similar to those in the West who, uh, who value their individual freedoms. And then we got to see that that wasn't the case in Russia, that so many elements of national identity do not work consistently with support for democracy. Um, and so I would again say, we shouldn't draw assumptions about China uh, that they have that hasn't been effectiveness in appealing to national identity, which is uh, distinctive from and critical of the West. Okay. The next lot of questions again, I'm pairing two together. The first one comes from Graham Hutchings at uh, Oxford, and he would like to ask you about where do you see the trajectory of Cold War 2.0 ending? What would you see as the trajectory. The parallel question to this is from a Chinese PhD student at Princeton who would like to ask you whether there is a possibility for China and the United States to compete constructively and avoid the extreme tension of the old Cold War. And if so, what should both sides do to achieve this? Okay, really challenging questions. Uh, I think we'll see ups and downs in this Cold War as we saw in the first Cold War. There were periods of relative optimism in the first Cold War, detente under Nixon and Brezhnev. Uh, there was optimism under Khrushchev. Uh, there, were, uh, there were periods where things got a little bit better. And although I think the basic conditions of the Cold War will prevail, um, there will be efforts on both sides to try to keep things peaceful, to work out ar arrangements for the problems that are most serious. Um, in the 2000 and 2000s, uh, particularly in George Bush's second term, there was an understanding reached on Taiwan. 
there was cooperation on the six party talks for a while. We thought we were able to work better together. So I can see possibilities for that again. Uh, but the problem right now is that both sides uh, see the beginnings of the Cold War as reason to intensify the positions that the other side doesn't want. So China's new rules on, civil, on the Coast Guard being able to fire, to use live ammunition uh, in areas where China claims sovereignty, um, that is a worrisome development. The US moves on Taiwan such as inviting the de facto Chinese ambassador to the Taiwan ambassador to the United States to the inauguration. Um, that angers the Chinese. So there are going to be steps right now that are more likely to deepen the Cold War. Uh, that, uh, where does it end? Um, I would not rule out some military uh, conflicts, um, perhaps brought about by third parties, such as North Korea. Um, I would not rule out a conflict over Taiwan. The differences are so intense and China's timetable is pretty short. Um, but there's also the possibility in the East China Sea with um, the Senkaku or Diaoyu Islands, uh, with China re re becoming more aggressive and the US standing firmly behind Japan and Japan expecting the US to be involved if China tries, for instance, to uh, take physical control over these islands or to force Japanese ships to stay away from the islands. So there are a whole series of issues that are dangerous right now and maybe more dangerous than any issues we had during the first Cold War. So how does it end? I think it has to end with uh, an understanding of uh, the limitations of what China can do and what the US can do. Um, and uh, that'll be worked out in stages as we come close to uh, conflict, as tensions rise, can we work out certain understandings. But my expectation right now is that the US would like to work those out, but that China is the driver in trying to expand from the first island chain to the second island chain, to take over Taiwan, to solidify control over the South China Sea, to do other things. And that'll be very difficult under those circumstances to resolve these issues, unless China decides as the Soviet Union did that it can be more of a status quo power. Now, as for um, the question from the Princeton student, um, can we um, can we control this? I mean, I would like to see proposals for how to uh, re-emphasize cooperation, the spheres of cooperation, and I think after the U.S solidifies its alliance ties, uh, it'll probably go to China with some proposals of cooperation on issues like climate change, certainly on non-proliferation and on handling uh, uh, some types of arms control, which China so far is not interested in. Um, if those types of initiatives can get some positive response, then um, we may be able to stabilize things for a while. After all, China is gaining. China just had a year when it did so much better than the United States. As the rising power that's gaining, China doesn't need to be in a hurry. Uh, so if there's a sense in China that of more greater patience and the sense of the United States that it's counter hegemony strategy which I think is the big best term to use for the US strategy in the Indo-Pacific, that that strategy can be strengthened um, and both sides accept uh, 
the limits that, that, that at, of the time. Uh, we may have a period of years where uh, things don't really get out of control. That, that's my hope right now. The next pair of questions focus on um, Southeast Asia and the South China Sea. I have um, William Knight in London who would like to ask you about where do, where do you think Vietnam fit into the Russian thinking in this general scheme of thing? The second uh, question. Okay, go ahead. The, the, the other question, this other question uh, is from a student in Vietnam, uh, Kong Lei, Lei. And the question is about how the Biden administration will respond to Chinese territorial ambitions and perhaps aggressions in the South China Sea. Um, from the Russian point of view, Vietnam is their number one partner in Southeast Asia. And the only free trade agreement between the Eurasian Economic Union and Southeast Asia or any, any other country, Russia doesn't have free trade agreements, is with Vietnam. And they signed the agreement and trade only increased $1 billion in a year. And then of course it fell during the pandemic. So there's really little to speak of it. Russia also counts on Vietnam as a purchaser of its weapons um, and so on. But Vietnam will like to keep Russia as a partner, um, but it, it becomes more difficult if Russia is drawing closer to China and China is seeking more support for its assertive behavior in the South China Sea. So far, Russia has uh, tried to stay out of the South China Sea issue. It has not stood for Vietnam's position and it has not criticized China, but it just tries to be quiet on that issue. But I don't see those kinds of uh, hedges as working for very long now as issues get more intense. So my guess is that the Vietnam-Russia relationship will weaken much as the Russia-India relationship has been weakening. Uh, but Russia will try very hard not to let that happen. Vietnam is too important for Russia right now. Uh, as, but, but nonetheless, it's it not nearly as important as China. And if China and the US struggle in the South China Sea, uh, and Vietnam is involved, Russia is not going to stand up for Vietnam. Um, now, in terms of what the Biden administration position will be in South China Sea, I think it will be an in further um, intensification of freedom of navigation operations, which increase substantially from the Obama period to the um, Trump period, uh, that basically the US is now supporting the Quad, seeking to expand the Quad into a Quad Plus, seeking consensus on dealing with issues in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, trying to get India more deeply involved, looking for multilateral uh, military exercises that would show China the limits of what it's doing in these areas. Um, I don't think the US, if China is assertive in this area, I think the US will be similarly assertive. So that's why I, I, this is a hot spot right now. And I don't know what the new decision by China to uh, let its Coast Guard fire um, on other countries, whether Philippines or Vietnam or anyone else who has territorial claims in the South China Sea, what that will do. But I only see the United States as standing firm in this area. The next question comes uh, from Nick Tapp in London. And it is 
really broadening the range of issues we are we are we are, we are discussing uh, today. And he would like to ask you this: China has been a big buyer of food commodities in the second half of 2020, in particular wheat, corn, soybeans, milk, and meat at volumes higher than expected by the market. And with exhortation by Xi Jinping to increase domestic food production, and then the Chinese Air Force been entering Taiwanese airspace in huge force in the last two days. Is there any connection between the two? Is the Chinese economic muscle and is uh, political muscle related or military muscle here? Um, I suppose the effort to create a more self-sufficient China um, and to prepare for an emergency uh, by building up supplies uh, could, could be significant. Um, I, uh, I don't know if there is some plan to meet the Biden administration with a show of force, uh, particularly over Taiwan. Um, uh, China may think that Trump and now Biden have crossed a red line on Taiwan. They may think that now they've resolved to their satisfaction, the Hong Kong situation. Hong Kong, Taiwan is next. Um, so there may be a, a degree of impatience on those issues. And uh, um, it, it may be that they've decided that uh, already uh, the situation has turned bad enough that China has to be more assertive. Um, I think people were quite surprised in 2008, 2009, that China in the global financial crisis shifted its thinking, maybe accelerated its timeline much more than people had anticipated. Uh, many people were saying, uh, China's looking at for a win-win situation. Uh, China is cautious and then it took advantage of the global financial crisis, changed its thinking. That also was when Xi Jinping was uh, newly installed on the political standing committee and uh, uh, may have exerted more influence. Um, but now we have to ask, did the pandemic and the US turmoil and misfunction and China's success have a similar impact in accelerating uh, the timeline for China to act more aggressively? Uh, I don't think we know the answer yet. Okay. The next question I pick comes from a student at the LSC who is currently in Hong Kong, uh, Lo Ping Lai. And the questions the student would like to put to you is about the role of Hong Kong in Cold War 2.0, since Hong Kong played a very important role in the uh, first Cold War. And the question is, how can Hong Kong take advantage of the changing relationship between China and the United States to survive? <laughs> can it be done? I don't think the US has leverage over China and Hong Kong. I mean, if China, wants to improve relations with China and with the US. If their goal in 2020 is to try to take issue off the table that are burdensome to this relationship, then they might say Hong Kong can be treated um, differently, less uh, aggressively. Um, so if that were the case, if we're now talking about reaching some broader understanding to calm tensions between China and the United States, Hong Kong could enter the picture, but only under those conditions. If the situation worsens, if we have Cold War 2.0, as I assume, then I don't see how Hong Kong uh, becomes an issue that the US can influence in any significant way. 
and certainly other countries in the region, no matter how much they think about Hong Kong, such as Japan, uh, will use Hong Kong as a lever to uh, try to change Chinese policy in other areas. There are too many other priorities that countries have, uh, and they feel they have too little of uh, leverage on Hong Kong. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm doubtful about uh, promise there. Okay. Next question I pick comes from Norman uh, Stockman in Scotland. And this goes more back to your core presentation. The question is, another possible difference comes about through the development of communications. In the first Cold War, there was very little communication between the population of the superpowers and consider considerable mutual ignorance. With the internet, it is less possible for such mutual ignorance and lack of communications to be maintained. Is it significant? Well, there was talk for quite a number of years from the 1990s that the information revolution would mean that barriers to countries would diminish and it would be easier to get mutual understanding. But in fact, mutual perceptions have become more negative. So even though we've had so many Chinese students studying abroad, so many Americans interested in China and admiring China for many things it's done, um, our communications haven't led us to greater trust. They haven't been able to reduce um, security tensions between the two. Um, and now that when you talk about communications, people are saying um, the Chinese have a firewall. Um, they don't, they want to control what information comes into the country. It's getting worse. Um, America has had reporters expelled from China. American access to Chinese information is getting worse. Um, it doesn't look promising right now in the area of communications. We're perhaps moving to two systems of information technology, a Chinese web and a Western web. Um, and uh, this could bring back a kind of bamboo curtain uh, parallel to the iron curtain where uh, information isn't so easily moved from one place to another. Russia has just announced uh, new um, controls on Radio Free Europe. So it's likely that uh, communication in the United States and Russia will be diminished as well. Uh, sure, people are finding some ways to get around these barriers, but I'm afraid uh, we have a, a negative streak right now going on in the communications arena. The next question comes from uh, Thomas Claffin in Boston, Massachusetts. Do you think the Chinese Communist Party autocratic rule reflects Marxism, or is it more a reflection of 3,000 years of Chinese culture with its top-down rule by an emperor? That's uh, a difficult question to answer, but it's one I think about a lot. So I should be able to say something coherent. Um, I think we've underestimated the legacy of socialism, of communism, and how much it endures in China and Russia. Um, and that legacy uh, established forms of control uh, in China, a Communist Party that's still functioning, um, a, a vertical way of organizing society, and many other things. So I would say, I think that's the dominant factor. Uh, I also think that it's not Mar Marxism and really isn't the, the term I would use. I would say just as Confucianism 
is reinterpreted to reflect the, um, the, the thinking of the socialist system in China. Marxism was reinterpreted by Lenin and then by Stalin and Stalin established the foundation for the systems that, had ex that existed in the Soviet Union and then China. And I believe those systems were largely intact in the 1980s. So <clears throat> I don't think that, um, um, I would say that this is primarily Confucianism. Confucianism actually had two contrasting strains. There was what de Berry called liberal Confucianism. And in the late 80s and 90s, people were saying, maybe Confucianism can be blended with, um, uh, with mo modern development and post-communism and create a, a kind of community in East Asia where they all share some of the traditions. Um, but less the authoritarianism. And then there was the, what Fritz Mote in his book on Imperial China called the, um, the transformation of Confucianism mainly by alien dynasties or by the peasant Ming controlled dynasty. And that really made Confucianism much more authoritarian uh, by its final periods. So, Yes, there are certainly elements of, of Confucianism that have been consistent with China's uh, socialist authoritarianism, but I think uh, I'd weight the socialist side more. The next question is a bit um, slightly un un unusual, but um, I think it should be put to you. And this is from Sam Chan. And he says that the Chinese often accuse the United States of having a Cold War mentality, no matter what the justification for the Cold War measures may be. Does your lecture not exactly prove the Chinese point? No, the Chinese began stressing more the Cold War mentality when Obama and Hillary Clinton and Kurt Campbell came up with the pivot or the rebalance to Asia, which was far from a Cold War mentality. In other words, they took a policy which was eager for um, working more with China, but re-strengthening the US position in the Indo-Pacific, and they distorted it as Cold War mentality. I would argue that the US and moving towards a recognition that a Cold War is occurring is responding to the driving force of China. For me, the last 30 years in this region have been much more about China as the country we should be watching than the United States. And I take fault, find fault with so many people concentrating on US thinking, U.S. policy, and ignoring the thinking in the region, and particularly Chinese thinking. Chinese, they, there's this media uh, obsession with what the U.S. is doing, and of course Trump only added to that greatly, uh, when we should be paying so much more attention to what the Chinese are writing and saying. And therefore, I think it's a defensive reaction. Recognition of a Cold War is not saying it's a desirable thing. It's saying this is the reality that we observe. The next question, and it may well have to be the last question that I can pick, is from Laura Alvarado. What role, if any, will you expect the EU to play in a second Cold War. The last 30 years, particularly since 2016, has seen a more independent-minded and united Europe. So could China challenge US-European cooperation? <laughs> 
I think China will try very hard and it's made inroads in parts of Europe, particularly Central Europe. Um, and it, uh, when the US calls for a summit of the democracies, it's not clear that the, US, the EU will be uniformly supportive. Um, I think with 5G, we're already seeing US-EU relations tested. But recently, both Great Britain and France have indicated a stronger interest in becoming part of the Indo-Pacific uh, sort of coalition of countries in, uh, in sending um, ships um, to the region and working with Japan and working with India. So, and of course, there is the proposal for the D10 um, that the summit in Great Britain uh, would be of uh, the G7 would combine with the Quad and create a new kind of organization, the D10. Um, so I see um, uh, the EU not easily working as a unit, but the some of the made country, major countries of the EU um, uh, trying to figure out how they can cooperate with the United States. It's been difficult because of the Trump period. The legacy has created a lot of distrust. Um, I'm sure though that uh, a number of people in the Biden administration, beginning with Iran policy and Russia policy, will try to find more cooperation with the EU on China as well. And with Great Britain becoming separate, separate from the EU, uh, it'll be probably the, for, the leader in finding common ground with the United States. Well, thank you very much, Gil, Professor Rosmond. It's been a really fantastic and thought-provoking occasion. I do apologize to many of you who have raised questions that I have not been able to select and put to Professor Rosmond, but please be reassured that your questions will actually be forwarded to him after the event so that he knows at least what are the questions that have been raised. That would be wonderful and I, maybe I can answer some of them directly. Well, thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing some of you at our webinar next week. Thank you. Bye. And thank you, Gil.